Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation this morning is the Gospel lesson on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of the seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, what is the most important thing you think I want to accomplish with every student in catechism class? What's the most important thing you think I want to accomplish with every student that I ever have in catechism class? I'm not going to tell you my answer right now. Because I'm going to give you also some other information is, and that the most important thing that I want to accomplish for every student in my catechism class and even in the last two years with Molly Peebles, I'm not able to accomplish. I'm not able to make it happen. After 60 weeks, I've been unsuccessful. No, I haven't. Yes, I have. I've been unsuccessful, but what I wanted to happen to you, and I don't know when it happened because it's been there for a while anyway, is there. Now, some people will guess you want them to end up in heaven. Not yet. You can live for a long time yet. Grow up, get married, see your dad cry. Or beat up a guy, I don't know, one of those things will happen. As you date and go into that part of your life, hopefully there is a marriage and there's children, and then eventually grandchildren, and you have what we call that full prosperous life. And if you decide some other path, may you be happy in that path. There is no prescribed path for any of us in this life besides what you want to do with it. And that's why I also say there's something that I can't accomplish with people that I would like to happen to everybody. But that type of life, the, the picket fence, the big house, the poor kids, cat, dog, and all that other stuff, or being single and already enjoying your life and different things and accomplishing great things and inventing things and become president of the United States or whatever, that's your life. But what do I want to have happened to you? And I can say it that way because there is evidence of it already. That what I want to have happened to you has already happened. But I will say it is not because of my doing. In catechism class, there are things that I can accomplish. There are things that I not only attempt to do, but I can feel at a certain point in time I can accomplish them. I can teach facts. I can teach stuff, information. I can communicate. I can tell you what the Ten Commandments are. I can tell you what God's law is. And I can tell you that, and you have already gleaned that, that they gave, were given by God to show us our sin, to show us what's wrong with us, to show, act like that mirror and say, ooh, this is how God looks at me. I'm not holy. I'm not perfect. I have failed. And not just with the commandments, but we rub it in a little bit with the what does this mean parts to really get it there so that you realize I've broken all of them, even though rightly I'm not a murderer, adulterer, or a thief. But that was the setup. The Ten Commandments are the setup for the other thing that I, or next thing that I, we went through facts of the Apostles' Creed which you so eloquently put into how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit save you. Because it's not just that the Father's got creation in his resume, and then he's done. He's been just sitting there for the rest of the time. Seven, six days of work, and then he's rested ever since. 
And God the Son only had one job, that's to come to earth for a 33 year period, get that job done, and now he's resting and not really doing anything. And now we depend upon the Holy Spirit to come into our lives to help us with our faith and our relationship with God. But as you put it in your essay, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been working together through all of those things. All three were there in creation. God the Father created the Word, but he used the Word, the Son of God, to create things, and the Holy Spirit's hovering over the waters, so they're all there. Saving us from our sins, all of them are working together. From God the Father sending the Son, the Son doing the job, the Holy Spirit helping not only at the baptism of Jesus, but helping us believe these things, because if we don't believe them, then the Son's death on the cross does us no good. And even the Father and the Son help the Holy Spirit, because that's who we're usually praying to when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, and we ask him for these various spiritual blessings and physical blessings, which is what we went through also, the Lord's Prayer. Remind ourselves that most of that prayer is asking for spiritual stuff. Help us be better Christians, help us be better Christians, help us be better Christians. That's just about the essence of the Lord's Prayer. Help us keep your name holy. May your kingdom come into our lives. May, may we do what your will is. Well, then we got our stuff with the daily bread. Help us with all the other things in life. And then we tack on that little doxology, that hymn of praise, which wasn't there in Jesus' but is the kingdom and the power and all of that stuff. And I've also taught you facts about sacred acts. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, where God said, I want you to do these things, connect this promise with this visual aid, and then you will receive this blessing from me in baptism and the Lord's Supper. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we believe that something's happening there beyond just, again, the physical things that we can see. Those facts I could teach you. Those facts I can grade you on. Those facts you've passed tests and many, many quizzes on. But eventually, it still comes down to what I really want to have happen in your life, I cannot do. And that's love for God. I can't do that. I can't impute love for God in any catechism student. I can't impute it in my own children or my grandchildren. I can't impute that love for God. Think of it like on Father's Day, or we equate it also with Mother's Day. As parents, fathers and mothers, what are we always trying to do for our children? Get them to grow up just like us, right? Why not? I'm pretty good. So are you. No, you want them to grow up to be good. You want them to grow up to be awesome. In fact, most of the time as parents and grandparents, we want our children to surpass us, don't we? And yet still have a small ego, even if they surpass us. But we can't make those things happen. We can teach, we can guide, we can show by example, but eventually it is their life and their decisions to do certain things. And that's why I can't impute, I can teach and I can example love for God by the way I talk about God, by the way I act toward God. But every one of those students eventually has to get that into their own life. Now, without stereotyping too much, I'll say it's easier with girls than boys. Boys take longer at a bunch of different things. Maturity is one of them. Love's one of them. Girls get into that quicker. So I really should confirm girls at like 14 and boys at 30. <laughs> Would it work then? Love for God is, is the ultimate goal. And when I see that happen, that they get through the commandments and they get through the creed and other stuff, but I see that they have this relationship in their life with God, and it's not just, oh, I answered Pastor Cracklow's quizzes, how did I do today? Oh, they're still coming to church, their body is still present in this building. That's okay, too. But when I see somebody who gives evidence of, I really like what God has done for me. And I would like other people to know it too. And at least I want to show God how much I love him. I mean, isn't that what makes fathers?
But if you know they really like you, and they still look to you as somebody to come to and ask for advice, isn't that the best? But you can't force that. You can't infuse that. That has to come from inside them. But when it comes from inside them, that's really cool. That's really cool. And with this confirmation again today, I see something really cool. I see a love for God. She's not just digested facts and then spit out the right ones in her nice essay. But I know where that essay came from. It didn't come just from here, it came from here. And I'm happy today. I'm happy today, thank you. And it reminds me to say, well, have I been doing that with God lately? Or am I just going through the motions as a minister because it's my job and I get paid? Well, I hope I reflect on the right things again today for even myself when I think about my Heavenly Father on Father's Day. He loves me. He cares for me. He sent Jesus to die for me so I could live in an awesome place for eternity. You've heard me say many times that when I retire, Lynn and I are going to put our stuff in storage. We're going to get that fifth wheel and that pickup truck, and we're going to explore the United States for a while, grab the grandkids every once in a while, and have them with us for a few weeks, then send them back to their parents, and then settle down in some sort of more permanent dwelling after we're done with that. But I understand the analogy that Paul used in the, the tent analogy. I mean, he was a tent maker. Those were part, that was part of his trade whenever he didn't have enough money from his mission work. He'd sit down, make some more tents, sell them, and now he's got some money to go on to the next city. But he also knew what he was trying to tell the Corinthians when he talked about the idea of a tent. Because most of the people that he was talking to in Corinth didn't live in tents. They lived in houses. Why am I getting a fifth wheel and a pickup truck instead of a tent? I think that's a no-brainer, isn't it? You think at this age I want to sleep on the ground? You think I want to get up off the ground to try and get ready for the day? Do you think I want to be somewhere in Canada when a storm comes through in a tent? You're nuts if you think that. Even Lynn would never go along with that, let alone I want to do that. We're getting the biggest RV we can, within reason. I still like gas mileage to be down a little bit. So maybe a 37-footer instead of the 40. But it's going to have a TV and a satellite air conditioning, shower, toilet, big fridge for all my Mountain Dew. It's got to have that because I need some of my luxuries while I'm here on this earth. But it's still not a house, still not a permanent place to live. We, I guarantee, you know, we talk about doing it for a year. That might not happen. That might not happen. I'm a realist. In fact, being gone from the grandkids for a year, that ain't going to happen. Lynn will kill me by then. She'd go through withdrawal. I have a Mountain Dew addiction. She has a grandchildren addiction. Hers is okay. So those things will get modified. But I also like what Paul talked about here is that remind myself of this is all temporary. And I've got a wonderful place to live for eternity. Now the difference between Molly and I today is I know I'm closer to that than she is. You don't have to think about it yet. You still got to get through school and get a job before you start thinking about retirement and what's after that. But I'm at that point already. So I understand Paul's lesson a little more closely as to that next life. But at the same time, no matter what stage of life we're in, whether we're 14 or 62, there's that wonderful reminder that God's got our reservation already there. Whenever it happens, 80 years from now, 20 years from now, we've got that reservation because you and I are God's friends. He's adopted us into his family. We're his children. We're in the will. What do I do? What do you do to maintain that relationship? 
Well, if I gave you the quiz question right now, you would say, what is it that keeps you strong and nurtures your faith? And you would answer, the means of grace. And then I'd look at John back there and say, do you still remember what the means of grace are? Since you're on summer vacation already, but I get you back next year. That gospel in the word and in the sacraments, that I read the Bible, I go to church, I nurture myself with the sacraments to keep that love for God not only alive, but flourishing. So it not only keeps me safe on that path to eternal life, but I reflect it to the world. I reflect it to the neighborhood with my gospel light. So that hopefully maybe somebody else will see the love of God in me, see the love of God in you, and maybe say, you know, I want that too. May that be something that we all desire for our lives.